Hello, I'm Pastor Stephen Chambers from Philadelphia Baptist Church in Rutledge, Georgia, and I want to thank you for joining us for this special message from the Word of God. I would invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Psalms, to Psalm 3. You know, throughout our life, we are going to face many different troubles. And it's interesting how the idea of being in trouble changes as we grow older. When you're a little kid, being in trouble means that you've done something wrong and you're going to get punished for it. But as you get to be older and become an adult, being in trouble means that you're facing a problem that is far bigger than you can handle. Now, troubles come and go. Some are big, some are small, some are short-lived, and some don't have an end in sight. But how we handle troubles is very important. When you're faced with what you might call adult-sized troubles, what should you do? Well, you should do what David did and pray. David was no stranger to trouble. The story of his life is filled with troubles that he faced from the time that he was a young man facing Goliath until uh, he was an old man in the story we're going to talk about today, running from his own son. He faced all different kinds of troubles. But David learned early on that in his troubles, he had to trust God. As a young man, when he stood before King Saul, he declared, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. So whether it was facing Goliath, hiding from Saul, or running from his own son, David knew that the best answer for troublesome times was prayer. Psalm 3 was written by David when he was on the run from his son Absalom, who had revolted and overthrown the kingdom and run David out. From this psalm, we learn that even in the most troubling circumstances, we must trust God and He will deliver us. Let's begin by reading this psalm. Psalm 3 in verse number 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, There is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for Thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon Thy people. Selah. From verses 1 and 2, we see the distress that David was in. Now, in your Bible, you may have under the heading of Psalm 3 a description. In mine, it says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So we know most likely the event that David was referring to when he wrote this psalm, and certainly the description of his troubles in verses 1 and 2 fits the historical record of Absalom the time David was dealing with Absalom's revolt. Verse 1, he says, Lord, how are they increased that troubled me? Many are they that rise up against me. Now, the story of Absalom's revolt is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 15. So let's take a moment to look there. 2 Samuel chapter 15. Now, David had many sons. But on this particular occasion, it was his son Absalom who had led a rebellion against David. We won't take time to go into the backstory, but it had to do with David's failure to deal with some other family problems in the past that resulted in uh, really this uh, uprising. And that culminated with David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba and murdering her husband. And for that, the prophet had told David that that from his own family, there would come someone who would rise up against him. So this that we will read about here in 2 Samuel chapter 15 
came as a result of David's bad decisions, his sinful decisions in the past. Let's begin reading in verse number one. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. On this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now look down at verse number 12. Uh, after Absalom has uh, led this uprising, Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gileonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Now this is just a portion of the story. And for sake of time, we, don't, we won't go into many more details, but this is what David was facing. He had been king for years now, but, but now here he is on the run as a fugitive because his own son has rebelled against him. David had a very big problem. His situation here was distressing to say the very least. This situation was a family problem, a friend problem, a financial problem, and a political problem all rolled up into one. Absalom was described here as increasing and growing in strength while David was diminishing in strength and influence. But the worst attack that he faced was not financial or from his family or political. The worst attack he faced was spiritual. Note what verse number 2 of Psalm 3 says once again. Many there be which say of my soul... There is no help for him in God. Think about that. Here's David on the run, running, fleeing for his life. He's lost his kingdom. He's lost his friends. He's lost most of his family. They've all turned against him. And what are they saying? They're saying there's no help for him in God. In essence, they're saying God has turned his back on him. Heaped on David's already breaking heart were these accusations that God had abandoned him. Now, given the fact that David's in this situation in large part because of his own sinful choices, there's no doubt in my mind that he was tempted to feel guilt. And already there were voices within him that were probably saying, you deserve this. God's not going to deliver you this time. He's just going to leave you to your fate. And added to that were these on the outside who were saying the same thing in essence. There's no help for him in God. God's not going to deliver you this time. All of these things that are crowding into his mind at once. Now I ask you, do you have troubles? Maybe there are people troubling you. Maybe it's your own thoughts that are sometimes troubling you. Maybe it's a situation beyond your control that's troubling you. And certainly we live in troublesome times. Here recently in 2020, we have faced a, a number of things that have really turned our society inside out. Of course, we had COVID-19 that we're still dealing with. And here in the last few weeks, we've had the rioting and the anarchy that has arisen and we look around us and we see nothing but chaos and turmoil. We live in troublesome times. And on top of the things that are happening nationally and globally, each of us is dealing with our own personal troubles, whether it, it be health problems or maybe it's family drama or maybe it's some kind of a financial trouble that we're in. We're all dealing with troubles. And in all of this, our adversary, the devil, wants to whisper in our ear, there's no help for you and God. God's not going to help you this time. You're on your own. What should we do? 
in troublesome times like these? Well, we should do what David did. We should pray. We've seen his distress. Now let's read verses 3 and 4 again. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. Here we note David turning his attention away from his distress to his defender. Rather than focusing on his son who had rebelled against him and his friends who had abandoned him, David turned his focus to God, the one who would never abandon him and who would always defend him. David mentions the protection of God. He says, Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. What a beautiful picture that is of God's defense of us, that God is our shield. In Bible times, there was a certain name that they would give to a soldier without a shield, and that was dead. <laughs> you didn't go into battle without some form of protection from the enemy's onslaught. You, you had to have a shield to protect you from the spears and the arrows and the sword strikes. And that shield was probably the most important thing to protect you. Yes, you might have other armor on, but that shield was the main form of defense. And David says, that's what God is for me. He is my shield. He's the one that protects me from the attacks of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 6, where we read of the armor of God, we read about putting on, or taking up rather the shield of faith. Now, how is faith a shield for us? How does faith protect us? Is it faith alone? No, it is the object of our faith that protects us. When our faith is in God, then our souls are protected. It's not faith in faith, and it's certainly not faith in others. It must be faith in God. It is the object of our faith, faith that makes our faith effective. Now notice also the encouragement that David found in the Lord here. He said, you are the lifter up of mine head. The idea here is very visual that David is just, he's weighed down, he's burdened, he's distressed because of all of his troubles. But God comes and he lifts up David's head. He, he stands him up on his feet. He stands him up straight again. He encourages him in his time of trouble. David looked to God to encourage him. And when he turned from his problems to the one who could solve his problems, his heart was encouraged. 1 Samuel 30 and verse number 6 says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Look, if you are trying to find encouragement in your circumstances or in your friends or your family, Maybe sometimes you'll find some encouragement in that, but not always, and sometimes seldom. The only place where you can find true encouragement all the time is in God Himself. Because God Himself is the only one who's always there for you and who will never fail you and who never changes. Now, how was David encouraged and why was he confident that God would defend him? Because he knew God had heard his cry. Verse number four, I cried unto the Lord and he, with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. David knew that God heard him. See, there was an assurance in David's heart that God was not just some God out there somewhere, but that he was David's personal friend. So that when David called out, he knew God would hear him. What a blessing it is to know that as a child of God, when we pray, God will hear us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. God is listening for your prayer. I believe that God wants to hear our prayer even more than we want our prayers to be heard. And David, because he had this confidence that God had heard him, he was encouraged. What a wonderful blessing it is to know that the Almighty God, the Creator of the universe, is on our side. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Think about that question. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, is God for us? Well, if you're a child of God and you are seeking to do God's will and you're living in obedience to God, then absolutely you can say, God is for you. Well, if that's the case, then who can be against us? Is there anybody strong enough to defeat our almighty protector? No. So David, in his distress, remembers his defender and cries out to the Lord in prayer. What was the result of this? Verse 5, I laid me down and slept. Now, David is still on the run at this point. He's not been delivered yet. But in the midst of his distress, he remembered his defender, and now we see him dozing. He lay down and slept in the middle of his trouble. How in the world could David do that? We talk about losing sleep over things that are troubling us many times. And the fact is that often our minds get so consumed with the problems we're facing that we do lose sleep over them. They keep us awake at night as we wonder and as I dare say we even worry about the problems that we have. But David says, I laid me down and slept. Not only did he sleep, he says in verse 5, I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves round me, uh, against me round about. So the result of David's prayer in turning from his distress to his defender was a peace that goes beyond human comprehension. The psalmist would say over in Psalm 127 and verse 2, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. God wants to give us peace in the middle of the storm that we are in. He wants to whisper to our souls, Peace, be still. And so see our souls calmed like the lake and the sea that Jesus was out on with his disciples when he said those words. He doesn't want us to be agitated. He doesn't want us to be irritated. He wants us to be calm. He wants us to be at rest. David, here in the middle of one of the most trying circumstances of his life, is able to rest peacefully because he had the peace of God that comes through prayer. And then, once he had rested, he woke up, for the Lord sustained him. He got up ready to face his challenges again. He said in verse number 6, I'm not going to be afraid of ten thousands of people. Tens of thousands, he said, aren't going to make me scared. Why? Because he was trusting in God. Only a child of God who is walking closely with God can honestly say that. Turn over to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And let's notice another place where David expresses similar encouragement. Psalm 27, verse number 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Those are the words of somebody who has turned from their distress to their defender and now has received that peace that is beyond human comprehension. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We have the promise of peace when we turn to God in our troubles, but we also have the promise of power, of strength, of the ability to continue on and to do the things that God has called us to do. Sometimes we feel in our trouble just like giving up, just not even trying anymore. Why do we even bother? Let's just sit on the couch all day and be a couch potato and, and just let whatever happens happen. We feel like that because we feel like we can't carry on. We don't have any more strength. 
And in that place, we need to be reminded that our strength is limited. And if we are depending on our strength instead of God's strength, we're going to fail. But when we turn to our defender, he empowers us. Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That promise is for those who wait on God, who depend on the Lord, who trust in Him. David knew this peace and he had this kind of power because he had placed his trust in God. He brought his burdens to the Lord in prayer. He didn't bottle them up. He didn't try and handle them all himself. He didn't think that he was big enough and strong enough to figure it out. He realized that he couldn't do it, and therefore he had to come to God. And you and I can experience the same peace and the same power in the same way. We have an open invitation to cast all our cares upon him, knowing that he cares for us, to come boldly before his throne to find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. We can have the same peace and power that David did if we would bring our problems to the Lord in prayer. Now let's look finally at verses 7 and 8 where David ultimately is delivered from his problems. He says in verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. So David ends this psalm with a, a final plea and a reminder that God has and God will deliver him again. His son, Absalom, wanted to murder David. He didn't want to just run him out of town. He wanted to kill him. But David here expresses full confidence in God that God would deliver him once again. In doing this, he recalls the other times that God had delivered him. He said, Thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Certainly David could look back in his life and see many, many times that God had delivered him from enemies that were far more powerful than he was. All the way back to the days when he was a shepherd boy, when God delivered the lion and the bear into his hand. And then Goliath, later the Philistines, delivering him from Saul. And, and over and over again, David saw God's hand work in his life to save David from the troubles that he was in. And David reminded himself of that recalling the times that God had delivered him in the past. And when we're in trouble, it is always good to remind ourselves of the times in the past that God had delivered us. Whatever trouble you're in today, you may not have ever faced a trouble like it before, but certainly there have been other times in your life when you were in trouble and God delivered you from those the fact that you're still here today dealing with another trouble is a testament to the fact that God has previously delivered you. Remember those times. Take a moment to stop and, and dwell on how God gave you the grace and the strength you needed to make it through those difficult times in the past. And let that be an encouragement to your heart. If God did it then, God will do it again. When we're in trouble, we need to be reminded of that, that just like God saw us through those troubles, He will see us through the troubles that we're in now. Psalm 20, 77, verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Don't forget what God has done for you previously and let it be an encouragement that God will deliver you again. David concludes by recognizing in verse 8, that God is the source of our salvation. If we're going to be saved, it's going to have to be by God. In David's situation, he was, he was outnumbered. He had uh, lost the favor of the people. And humanly speaking, he was in a completely desperate situation. Only God could deliver him. Now, ultimately, God would deliver David. And David recognized in verse number 8 again, 
Now, salvation belongs to the Lord. We cannot save ourselves. Our friends cannot save us. Our family cannot save us. As, as, as well-meaning as they might be, their power and their knowledge is limited just like ours is. The only one we can turn to to be guaranteed of salvation every time is the Lord. Only God can truly save, and He will. Now let's stop and consider a question. What was the biggest problem that we have ever faced? Now, some might be tempted to think of a particular financial hardship they were in, or maybe a, a health problem they faced, or maybe there was some kind of a relationship breakdown. But all of those things, while they were big problems, no doubt, they were not the biggest problem that we've ever faced. The biggest problem that we have ever faced was sin. Because that problem had eternal consequences. And there was absolutely nothing that we could do to save ourselves from that trouble. We were sinners. And because of our sin, we deserved to die and go to hell. But what did God do? God looked down in love and He sent His Son Jesus to save us from our sin, to solve our problem, and to deliver us. And when we trusted Christ as our Savior, assuming that you have done so, God saved you from the biggest problem that you will ever face. He saved you from your sin. Now, when we restore the right perspective then, and we realize that all of our other problems pale in comparison to that problem, it should encourage us that if God could and did save us from our biggest problem, then all these other problems should be no problem at all. All of our other troubles pale in comparison. If God saved us and delivered us from our sin, then He can deliver us from any other trouble we would ever face. And we can be assured that He will because verse number 8 says, Thy blessing is upon thy people. Now as we close, I want you to notice the very last word of this psalm. It's the word Selah. It's found three times in this particular psalm, and it's found a number of times throughout the book of Psalms. Now, what does the word mean? Many people believe that it was a, a musical annotation, essentially meaning pause, rest a while, and take a moment to think about what we've just said or sung. In fact, some people believe that it was a note to the instrumentalists to take a moment to make sure that their instruments were in tune before going on any further. Of course, in Bible times, you know, they didn't have modern instruments like today, and especially the stringed instruments would tend to get out of tune very quickly. And so they would frequently stop and check their tuning, or maybe they would retune to a different key before going on with the music. And so this was a musical annotation, but there is a wonderful spiritual application to be made here to stop and think about what you have just heard. To stop and make sure that you're in tune with what God is saying here. What is God saying in this psalm? What He's saying is that no matter what your trouble is, God Himself will deliver you from it. So what should you and I do? We should turn from our distress to our defender. We should be encouraged and we should be empowered by remembering that God is for us and therefore nobody can be against us. And when Satan tries to whisper to us, there's no help for you in God, that we be reminded from God's own words that salvation is of the Lord and His blessings are upon His people. Look forward to the deliverance that will come. Remember the deliverance that has been given in the past. Even in the most troubling circumstances, keep your focus on God and trust Him to deliver you. Selah. Heavenly Father, thank You for this wonderful encouragement from Your Word. Lord, we need it so often. We live in troubling times. 
And there are so many things happening around us that are just totally out of our control. And through these problems, Satan likes to whisper in our ear that, that there's no help for us in God, that, that you're not going to help us this time. Lord, help us to not give in to that temptation to think that way. Help us to have simple faith and trust in you to strengthen us and empower us and deliver us from our troubles. And when you do, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be filled with praise and gratitude for you and that we bring you the honor and glory that you deserve. Lord, I pray that you would quiet our troubled hearts. And Lord, that you would give us that peace that passes all understanding. And may we then be a testimony and a light to the world around us. That they would see how that we in the midst of all the craziness and chaos are able to maintain a a peaceful demeanor. May that be something that draws them to you to want to know more about you, about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we'd have the privilege of sharing that message of peace, the gospel of peace with them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.